So serious. So today is colloquium talk with uh, Dr. Lucas Orizovalo. He is affiliated with the Instituto per la Ciencia e Tecnologia di Plasma, Bari, Italy, and also in space and plasma physics, uh, School of Electrical Engineering, Com Computer Science at the Royal Institute of Technology, Stockholm, Sweden. Uh, his PhD is from uh, uh, the University of Calabria, uh, Italy, and also from French Riviera Observatory, uh, Nice. Uh, he was uh, affiliated formerly as a postdoc researcher at the University of Calabria. Then he was a visiting researcher at Space Science Laboratory, University of California, Berkeley. Uh, later, he was an associate professor in Ecuador, Quito. <laughs> and uh, nowadays, he's a visiting researcher. He was a visiting researcher in Uppsala and later in Stockholm. He, he was teaching a moment of hydrodynamics, known as time series analysis at the University of Calabria, space plasma turbulence in Uppsala, sun sunless interactions in ESA European Astronaut Center in Germany. He was visiting uh, many uh, institutions, for example, Medon Observatory, Paris, Queen Marie University London, uh, National Institute of Geophysics, BBC, we were there together once, and then Astrophysical Observatory Italy uh, in Rome, Miss nice Observatory France, Technical School of Catalonia, Barcelona. Uh, he had uh, several projects and grants in uh, which he was the PI, for example, the Swedish Research Council Research Grant. Uh, Uh, another research project at the University of Calabria, and also he was a coordinator, co coordinator in an FP7 European Marie Curie project on turboplasmas. Uh, regarding editorial activity, he was associate editors in, in Frontiers in Physics, in editorial board of advances, and Ciencias Ingenierias, guest editor in Planetary and Space Science. Uh, he organized more than 50 conferences and workshops. Uh, he had 20 invited talks. He has more than uh, 150 publications. And uh, from uh, publications, I will mention only uh, the publication entitled uh, called Intermittency in, in the Solar Wind Turbulence. So, probability distribution functions of fluctuations from uh, 1999. Uh, when I read his paper more than 20 years ago, maybe I realized first time that the Solar Wind is an excellent turbulence laboratory. And it it was influencing my research later. So thank you for that. The stage is yours. I'm sorry about that. I have to, to add because I don't, I'm not sure it's a good idea <laughs> to be influenced by okay. turbulence. Okay, so please include these collections. <laughs> <laughs> it was not a good idea that you read that paper, but every, everything else was okay. Thank you for the long, but like my whole CV introduction that you gave. So um, hello everybody, I'm very happy to be here and starting the year of colloquia at this uh, institute. And uh, I understand it's a kind of a hard task for me because it's still kind of Christmas mood. So I'll try to do my best to keep it light, as light as possible, which is gonna be impossible because this is talk about turbulence and turbulence is not something very easy to uh, digest 
So this uh, this talk is basically based on uh, on a review paper that I recently wrote together with my former student uh, Raffaele Marino, um, and this is a, a was published last year in the spring, and it's a very massive one. It's a, over 120 pages, so it, it required a couple of years. So I need to squeeze every possible talk out of it uh, in the next years because it's, uh, it was too much work uh, to just uh, let it skip. So uh, just a quick comment on my affiliations. I know uh, I'm a sort of a, we discussed it before at uh, lunch, sort of a gypsy in the field. I like to go, go around and visit places and change places uh, several times. But I have to say that my CNR institution is the, is the one which is my stable base in Italy. I've been there for more than no, nearly 20 years now. So uh, with, with a permanent position. So it's, it's always there and in the meanwhile, I do other things. Before, because I like collaborations and internationalization. So this talk is going to be about very broad title, Scaling Laws for the Energy Transfer in Space Plasma Turbulence. I'm going to try to go a little bit around across uh, some, let's say, basic, no, sorry. Yeah, okay. Some basic introduction on the solar wind and on turbulence, and then attack a few more specific cases. Uh, using an approach that we de developed and described in the, in the paper uh, I was referring to. Solar wind, uh, probably most people here are very familiar with it, at least familiar with it, is this expanding uh, wind coming from the sun, uh, accelerating corona uh, and filling the heliosphere. It's, uh, it's a very rarefied plasma, especially uh, when you go away from the sun, it, it does get more and more rarefied as the wind expands. And it's so ratified that it's nearly collisionless. Uh, collisions play a very limited role, at least at the first in the first approximation. This makes it a quite an interesting and complicated system to study. Um, and it's also very complex per se because it's got a lot of huge variety of parameters like I don't know speed, density, temperature, you, you name it. Anything is uh, is very variable in the solar wind. The one thing that is always true is that it's very fast. Uh, the, the propagation is always supersonic, superalphenic. So in these conditions, it's highly likely that it will produce turbulence. Any flow that flows very fast will probably be turbulence at some point. And the two images you see here are nice representations, I think. These are data and these are observations from stereo that uh, can measure in some way density of the plasma. Um, here is the sun to the right in this big picture and you see the wind blowing away from the corona. This is a part of the corona and then becoming the solar wind at some point. And you see the highly structured and complex and highly variable in time also uh, nature of these fluctuations. You also see the turbulent fluctuation in terms of this chaotic superposition of structure on all scales that you see here. Another example in this uh, case, this is near Earth space and there are a couple of comets uh, that are traveling and you see the solar wind is coming from the right, which is where the sun is. And sometimes there are some blobs of more dense matter and they hit the, 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 the wakes of the comets, the tails of the comets, and the tail of the comets start wiggling. Uh, and this is because of the turbulent nature of the fluctuation that is blowing on it, especially when the high density uh, slabs come into it. So these are nice views, but this was not known until recently. Otherwise, I mean, the, the imaging was not possible until recently. And so everything else was uh, theoretical at the beginning. And then with spacecraft started measuring the density up in space and the fields up in space, we had confirmation that solar wind existed. It's a nice history, uh, the way the solar wind has been first theoretically hypothesized and then measured and then finally seen. I think it's a quite uh, amazing journey. Uh, the, since the beginning, it was quite clear that if a solar wind existed, it should have a structure that is uh, composed of two main elements. One is the wind, the, the velocity of the plasma expanding, which is radial most of the time. And, uh, and the other second one is the solar magnetic field, which being the, the plasma, um, I mean, being a plasma, being the, the flow of plasma, it will carry the, the magnetic field along and the conditions for frozen in conditions. So the frozen in conditions are satisfied. So magnetic field and plasma are strong, strongly related 
and bound one to, uh, to each other. And so the structure was predicted to be uh, including also, sorry, a third element, which is the rotation of the sun, and that result in some sort of spiraling of the magnetic field lines in, in space. But also because the different regions of the sun can emit different speed of plasma jets, there will be different region with different speed and they blow over each other during the expansion. So everything makes it very complicated and very complex and highly inhomogeneous in the, in the heliosphere. Another example of uh, how variable and uh, complex can it can be is given by uh, the variability with the solar cycle. And left and right here, the pictures are two pictures of uh, uh, solar eclipses where you can see the structure of the corona. And these are real pictures, pretty ones, I think. And uh, the first one is uh, was taken near solar okay. minimum. The second one to the right is near the solar maximum. And it's a, it's appearing quite evident, we know very well now, that the, the structure of the corona is very ordered during minima with a very broad coronal poles where, where the magnetic field lines are open uh, at the poles and then the loops uh, and the current sheets in the middle. It's, this is the typical structure. On the other hand, during high activity, like now, for example, this becomes messed up and there are superpositions of structure over the whole surface of the sun. The coronal holes shrink a lot and they are more irregular and they move up and down and around. So the structure is a little bit more complex and this results in a very different uh, configuration of the heliosphere according to the solar activity. So there is this variability too. This is on large scale, this is 11 year scale variability of the sun activity. But from those 11 years, all the way down to, let's say, megahertz, there is fluctuations. There are fluctuations in the solar world. So this is a huge range of scales over with, and like time and in special scales over which the solar wind shows variability. I'm talking mostly about the solar wind, but in reality, even other space uh, environments can host the same properties, like the, the magnetospheres, for example. Uh, again, one more to, to describe the variability of the solar wind. Uh, this is a, there are time series taken by a satellite. This is probably Helios because it's uh, near the, uh, half the way between the sun and the earth uh, from 76, all data, velocity, density, temperature of the plasma, and then magnetic field, this is the magnitude, and then the, 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 the azimuthal and polar angle of the ma magnetic field. And it's clear again that there is a lot of irregularity, you see these uh, fluctuations which look, look very chaotic, but also there is some large scale structure. For example, there is an alternation between faster and slower uh, solar wind. This is a slow wind and then followed by a fast wind interval. And all this is uh, quite common and more clearly seen during low activity when the structure of the heliosphere is ordered and working well. In the high activity, it's a bit more complicated. Um, these are one more example of this, showing that, for example, besides the sheer plasma quantities, something else changes radically between fast and slow wind. Typically, in slow wind, the fluctuations of the field, the magnetic field, and the uh, and and the velocity, which are black and red in this uh, plot, are not particularly correlated. While during high speed wind, the correlation is streaking. So you can superpose velocity and magnetic field fluctuation nearly. Uh, perfectly in under given conditions. It's, this is alphanic solar wind, alphanic fluctuation. This is non-alphanic fluctuation because there's no alphanic correlations visible. This is not necessarily related to the speed of the wind. It's a bit more complicated than that. It's more related to the composition and which indicates that fast and slow wind or typically alphanic and non-alphanic wind come from different regions of the sun, like for example, coronal holes or region bordering coronal holes or other structures in the sun. So all this is just to say that there is a huge variability in the solar wind, which makes it a beautiful laboratory for studying plasma turbulence, as Zoltan was mentioned. How do we describe this? There are several ways to do it. Most of the people will use uh, kinetic theory to study the processes that happen there, like the uh, uh, framework. But for what we are interested in today, it's uh, MHD, it's more than sufficient. So we look at large scale description of the, uh, of the solar wind with, or the plasma in general, and 
we're not going to look into the microphysical processes that occur at uh, subion scales, but we keep it at what we call the fluid scale, so larger scale, larger than typical ion scales. In this approximation, the equations to be used are standard MHE. Here is an example of a very simplified version of it. Um, the one, so these are basically considering the plasma as a fluid of, of ions, of positive ions, with a current of uh, electrons on it. So it's described by Navier Stokes for the fluid part, coupled with the Maxwell for the fields that develop and the home flow for, for relating currents and electric field. And then there is, must be some closure typically on the energy or something like that, but that doesn't matter here. So these equations have one peculiarity which makes them very complex. And it's the fact that there are several, in this case, four in this form, uh, nonlinear terms, the terms that couple two variables like velocity and magnetic field, like in this case, it's twice the magnetic field and so on. So um, there is a coupling of, uh, of, of quantities that make them nonlinear. And nonlinearity in this kind of equations, very similar to Navier Stokes for fluids, is typically associated to emergence of um, turbulence. This happens when this term is the dominating term in the equations, as we will see later. So this makes the equations not solvable. There's no analytical solutions for the fully nonlinear equation, like in the in the normal form. This is actually one of those one million prize. Uh, uh, challenges uh, for mathematics, mathematicians, uh, and I think it's still far from being solved. But it's quite interesting because, yeah, the turbulence that they originate, it's seen everywhere. I mean, it, it's a very, very ubiquitous process. You find it in every system from, you know, astrophysical system. This is a supernova remnant, a galaxy or a jets from some, I don't remember what that is, probably a closer. Uh, Jupiter atmosphere, like a plume of smoke in a dark room, so, uh, some cyclone, uh, coffee with milk, everything shows turbulence. It's a very, very universal process found everywhere because this equation is very basic, basically. So that said, it's interesting to study and this is why I came into contact with it. Unfortunately, I would say, and then I will tell you why. <clears throat> Um, well, just a few motivations, why is it interesting to study turbulence uh, in the solar wind specifically? Uh, one of the things is probably one of the initial motivations for that is that if you look at, the, if you measure the temperature of the plasma in the heliosphere as the, uh, uh, the, the wind expands from the sun out in space, if you have an adiabatic expansion of the gas, that temperature should go down with a given power law, uh, power law of the distance. But if you look at the measurements from spacecraft, and this is true near the sun, but also far from the sun, these are all plots of temperature of the plasma versus the distance from the sun. And the, the decay of the temperature is usually slower than the, the, the adiabatic decay. Here you see, for example, the green line in the first plot is, uh, is the adiabatic decay. And the observation clearly show a much warmer plasma than it should be if it was just an adiabatic expansion. This means that something is heating the plasma during the expansion. And one of the major candidates for this is the turbulence, because turbulence dissipates. Dissipation creates, by friction in normal fluids, creates heating. And this heating might be the one that is feeding the observed discrepancy uh, of the temperature. So this is one of the major motivations to start studying turbulence. But there are, of course, uh, many more. Among those, I would say, uh, besides the heating, uh, explaining the heating and also the more in general energization of particles, even acceleration of particles in the solar wind, which are possible by the turbulence, it's also possible that the turbulence is a, well, actually it's known now that turbulence is one of the major drivers for the connection. Turbulence generates current sheets and this reconnect. And so you get reconnection driven by the turbulence. It also can drive all the field particle interactions that belong to the kinetic physics uh, real, like instabilities, some kinetic instabilities, or resonances or damping, all these things are taking the energy that comes from the turbulence and transform it into something else. So the turbulence has a leading role in that like, because it drives, it decides where things happen and where it does, they do not. So it's important to, to study this. So it, yeah, so that's very general comment. Uh, also, 
when people, so this uh, we are now, I was just looking at things at small scale that are driven by the turbulence. But if you look at the large scale instead, and you want to describe the way the heliosphere, uh, the, the, all the dynamical evolution of the heliosphere from the sun all the way to the, to the, to the other planets, uh, you need to take turbulence into, into account. It is one of the ingredients in the modeling, in the models for the heliosphere. Uh, because it affects the transport of energy and particle particles in the human magnetic field in the in the heliosphere. So it's important to, to know turbulence. It's just end of the story. There's no questioning about that. And that when the said things happen, turbulence is a bad beast. It's not an easy thing to deal with. Here I'm, I'm just writing a few quotations from some people that were not very happy about turbulence. The first one is uh, Horace Lamb. I was mentioning that yesterday at dinner with, with Zoltan. Uh, this guy in, in the 30s, when turbulence was starting to be stud studied, say, yeah, I'm old now, I'm gonna die. When I go to, to paradise, I'm gonna ask God that it explain me two things, quantum electrodynamics and uh, turbulence. And he's quite optimistic about quantum electrodynamics, like intending that turbulence is probably not gonna be able to, to understand, not even in paradise. Uh, Feynman also say, just don't read all, all of it, but there is a physical problem that is very common but unsolved, and this is the analysis circulation of turbulent flows. So Feynman is another, I would say, important voice in that, and, and that was 30 years later. So if you skip, this is 40 years later, uh, I got some discussion with this guy in the picture called Angelo Vulpiani in Rome, he's an expert in complex systems, and he's, he told me explicitly, like, I've seen minds much brighter than yours getting lost trying to solve turbulence. And he was referring to a person that we know in the field that is a little bit you know, out. Uh, we're not going to tell who. And recently I, I read uh, on a quantum, an interview on Quantum mag Magazine, some scientists on turbulence that say that turbulence is the place where careers go to die. So I'm sorry about it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I am still optimistic. Yeah, okay, like him. Okay, good. Good to know. Good for you. So, um, going a little bit deep, what, what is that makes uh, turbulence so interesting for us, at least? It's the fact that he has one important mathematical property, which is scaling invariance. Scaling invariance means that if you have a solution of the equation, like velocity, magnetic field, and all the other relevant fields, pressure and density in this case. And you have you, you can write a solution at a given scale. And then you change the scale from through a through a scaling factor. This lambda here for me is a scaling factor. So just changing the scale. Then the solution remains a solution at a different scale if you rescale it using a power law of the scale. Very complicated way to say that the fields are scaling invariance. So the fluctuations of the field have the same scaling properties, which means they are similar at large scale to the, the, what they are at smaller scale. This is mathematically uh, explained here, but in the end, the point is that the fluctuations of a field will be a power law of the scale, basically. That's the, the main message. This is quite important, and this is uh, something that it's true globally and uh, um, statistically. But it's a, it's a quite important property because it explains why turbulence people are obsessed with power laws. We look for power laws everywhere, and those power laws are there because of the scaling invariance of the equations, of the solutions of the equations. So this is a, um, an anticipation we're going to see uh, as data analysis in the, in the talk is going to be power laws everywhere. What is the small h? Uh, so this is a, a scaling exponent. Yes. So uh, yeah, you're right. So uh, when you do this transformation, you need to assume, for example, that the velocity scales as the, sc the scale to the power h. H is an arbitrary exponent, and this is called the other exponent, other exponent of the of the uh, of the field. And this is something that measures the regularity of the scaling of the quantity of the of the variable. And then once you fix this, then you have constraint on the way the time should scale because there is a relation between time scale and space and, and this fixes this. The magnetic field can have its own uh, arbitrary scaling exponent and so on and so forth. So uh, this 
parameters here are some arbitrary scaling exponents. There's no uh, limitation on that unless you do some phenomenology. So th these are, in principle, there can be any value. Uh, so scaling law, what do they represent? And what, what does it mean to have scaling invariance? So uh, the, the main concept was, I think, very really well represented by Richardson in the 20s, which made, it was a, a, a atmospheric uh, meteorologist or something like that, and made a model uh, to describe what he thought was happening in the turbulent cascade. So imagine there are vortices on a given scale. So imagine you take a cup of coffee and you start stirring uh, the milk or the sugar into the coffee, and, uh, like injecting some circular movement with your spoon. So these are the large scale injection uh, vortices in the flow. So because of the nonlinear terms of the equations that couple different scales one to, to another, and this is something that uh, uh, takes a, typically a third of a course of turbulence to explain uh, with, with math. Uh, so this generates some sort of stretch and folding of the structure, which will break and generate, this is a very simplistic way to show it, but maybe it gives the idea. Imagine this vortex that is stretched, twisted somehow, it breaks into smaller vortices. And so the energy that was contained in a large vortex at some point will be redistributed, in, for example, to smaller vortices once it breaks. And this, because of the scaling invariance of the questions, this will happen at any scale. So again, each vortex will be, vortex will be again breaking into two smaller vortices and so on and so forth in a process that is called a cascade of energy. The energy is injected here at some, some scale called, called an injection scale with some rate. This is epsilon here is typically uh, the, the, the so-called energy injection rate, the rate at which we are injecting the energy in the system. And that energy is then redistributed across the scale by this nonlinear interaction processes over structure of smaller and smaller scale that they all overlap in the end. But this happens all the way in, in a range which is called the inertial range. And at the end of this, when the size of the vortex is so small that viscosity or resistivity or whatever it is become an effective thing to take the energy out of the vortex so it can dissipate the energy rather than transfer it to other scales. At this scale, you have dissipation. This is called surprise dissipation scale. And there is a dissipation energy uh, rate. So, so energy dissipation rate. So the, the story of the energy is like that. It's injected, transferred across scale, and then dissipated. You stir, you create all the turbulence, and then at some molecular scale, uh, the dissipation occurs in fluids. In solar wind, it's a bit more complicated because there's no dissipation, viscous dissipation, because it's collisionless plasma. But that's another story, and we're not going to go into that. Um, the representation of this cascade, or redistribution of energy across scale, is typically made using uh, spectra. A spectrum of energy is the energy contained or associated to fluctuations of a given scale. And if you look at the spectrum, this same representation is reproduced here, and the spectrum typically comes out as a power law, again, because of the scaling invariance of the equations. So there is a power law redistribution of the energy. Of course, it, the smaller the vortex, the less the energy on it. It's kind of intuitive. But the way the energy on, on each vortex reduces is regular. And it happens always the same way along this range of scale where this cascade happens. This is called, again, the inertial range. Um, yeah, this is a more schematic representation of the same thing. And if you do some dimensional analysis, and I'm going to go through this, but it's a quite simple dimensional analysis. If you assume that the energy that injected, transferred across scale, and then dissipated is constant in time overall, globally, the, the volume average of this. So you have, a, you have a stationary state with no, with conservation of energy in some sense. If you assume that, then you can estimate dimensionally the way the velocity fluctuation should behave with the scale and determine that H parameter that we saw in the previous slide. And that H parameter turns out to be one third uh, overall globally. And this means that the spectrum of energy associated to velocity fluctuations will be a famous, uh, because in turbulence it's very famous, K to the minus five thirds. This comes out directly from this relation. <clears throat> 
Uh, so this is an expectation, a prediction for the spectra is universally observed. When you have Navier-Stokes nice turbulence, it's always like that. With plasma, it's a little bit more complicated. There are some variabilities of that, but but the phenomenology uh, methodology holds. That's how you would estimate the way it should go. So it should be simple, right? You got that, those fluctuations, you measure spectra, you get the slope, end of story. Nope, that would be too easy. So there are more things that come into play. And let's start from a real spectrum from solar wind data. It's a bit different from what we saw before. Before the spectrum would go down at some point here, there is a peak, which is where you inject the energy. And then there is a power low, and then there is an exponential decay. In the solar wind, the, those two things are not really observed. The first one at small scale, when you reach ion scales, there is no dissipation to remove the energy completely. And so have uh, uh, an exponential decay of the, of the spectrum. But instead, there are more nonlinear processes uh, associated with some linear processes of kinetic nature that transfer the energy in a different, in a secondary ion, sub ion inertia range or not inertia range. It's not very clear. This is still debated. And I'm not going to talk about it. But there's no exponential cutoff. It's a bit different. There's another power law, which means something. It's still not clear. And on the large scale, instead of having a peak, there is a really broad band uh, region of scales at which the energy is injected. This is because of the stronger inhomogeneity and variability of the solar wind. This means that there is not one single spoon stirring the coffee, but there's a lot of spoons together stirring the coffee at the same time. And all these are randomly distributed between each other. They're uncorrelated and they form a one over f, so k to the minus one spectrum in the, in the small scale. The, low frequency range. So um, this is more or less what we get in the solar wind, but it's still fairly okay. The slope or the exponent that we find here is very close to the, to the five thirds, which will be 1.77, but it's, it's definitely within error, it's nice. Uh, it's very close to the Kolmogorov expectation. So we are happy to say that there is a very broad inertia range of turbulence in the solar wind. That's, I think, undeniable right now. There's still someone that thinks, ah, but maybe no, but hmm. but there is one more complication, and the more complication, the extra complication is um, is universal. It's for all plasmas. It's not just sorry for all flows. All turbulence uh, is characterized by this thing, which is called intermittence. So the cascade that I was describing before is not completely correct. There is one detail, which is instead of redistributing the energy homogeneously in space, the turbulence has the tendency to accumulate the energy in small regional space. This is because basically you think of the same two vortices that are in interacting. Actually, I didn't say before, but it's not just one single vortex that breaks down, but in order to break down, it needs another vortex next to it to pull it and stretch it, right? Imagine this interaction between the two vortices. So what happens is that those vortices will prefer that the energy is transferred near where they touch each other, let's say this way. Uh, again, very, very uh, simplified way to, to say things. And this means that in some position, there will be a lot of transfer of energy. In other positions, far from where the two interact, there will be less transfer of energy. And this originates an inhomogeneous cascade of energy, where the energy is only transferred in some regions of space and not in other regions of space. Uh, transfer process. When you go at this very small scale, the dissipation of energy will be concentrated in very small, very tiny, but very powerful regions where there is a lot of small, but I mean, small in size, but very energetic vortices dissipating a lot of the energy. Uh, this is a process which is regulated by the fact that it's more efficient to remove the energy. So it's faster to remove the energy in a few high amplitude vortices than in many small vortices. It's just because of the, of the dissipation term, which is a number square of the, of the fluctuation. So, but this is a natural thing emerging naturally in, uh, uh, in turbulence. And this is the thing that is probably the most puzzling issue in turbulence is not really well understood why this is so mathematically and, and even in terms of statistics is not clear. There's still a lot of studies, and the paper that Zoltan 
read in 1999 was about description of the statistical properties of these fluctuations here and the way they change with the scale. Uh, and still 25 years later, we're still right at the same point more or less. Uh, another way to see this is to look at the data themselves. This is a time series where I'm estimating uh, what I call the delta V at a given scale. There is a, a, a formula just next slide or so. Uh, this is basically the a gradient of a field, in this case, velocity, a gradient of velocity across a given scale. So this is a large scale gradients. These are mid scale gradients, and this is small scale gradients. When I say large, small, I refer to the spectrum we saw before. Large is the injection scale, small is the dissipation scale, and intermediate is the intermediate scale. And as you see, the nature of the fluctuations is not the same. This is not a self-similar signal. So I was cheating before when I was saying that there is scale invariance. There is no scale invariance in some sense, but overall there is, but on locally is things are quite different. In particular, this signal is more or less, has more or less the same properties. Like this is a Gaussian noise in any position. So any, any, anywhere you look, this is gonna be the same. But if you go to smaller and smaller scale, difference will emerge. And for example, in this box where there were fluctuations here, and there's not much fluctuations in the small scale gradients. But if you go in this region where well, it's not very dissimilar, maybe there is a shear, but they're more or less similar. And trust me, they are both Gaussian. In this box, uh, this, is, this might be Gaussian fluctuation, but they are definitely not Gaussian. There are a lot of very large spikes, which make the tail of the distribution go up a lot. So this change of topology or geometry of the fluctuations with the scale is what's called intermittency. It's called intermittency because it's it's giving it's 30. It's about 30 minutes Thanks. past. Uh, yes. Because it gives this intermittent like off on uh, distribution of energy on the structure, on the dissipation structures. And this is again, very, very interesting. This is why so, the, sorry, the, the concept is that locally there is scaling invariance, but this is very local. As soon as you change position, the exponent will be different. And so overall, when you put everything together, you still have an average exponent that you can estimate statistically, but locally this will be very uh, variable, which means intermittency. This is related to a multifractal description of the cascade, but this is just a big word that I launched there just for fun and to make you nervous. Um, this is a word example, an example like before in the solar wind, you see that the way to study these things is to check the distribution function of, uh, of the fluctuations of the field. And in fact, these distribution functions are really Gaussian when you look at large scale, this is more or less one day distance uh, for estimating the gradient. These are Gaussian, but then when you go to smaller and smaller scale, the tail could go up and these are the tails that contain the, the spike in the fluctuations, which I were I was mentioning before. Last uh, theoretical point, and then maybe a couple of examples if I have time. Last theoretical point is, okay, all this is nice, and this was known well known for since probably mid uh, 20th century, and with no much advance. But there is another approach that is quite interesting, and it's again a statistical approach. But this one is. All, everything I said before is phenomenological. So you do dimensional analysis at most and statistics when you're uh, when you're lucky. And you, you see the way the statistical laws change with scale. But there's something that can be done a little bit more rigorously. And there is a mathematical derivation for it, which is sort of a theorem. So it's, it's quite uh, strong. And they are referred to as exact laws or third order moment laws. Uh, basically, it's it's about um, checking the flux of energy across the scale. So it's a sort of a continuity equation, but in the in the scale space. So instead of being physical space, it's in scale space. So how much energy enters a scale and exits that scale? So if you make a budget of that, and you can do that using a recipe for uh, taking the MHD equations, manipulating a bit, and writing down equations for the energy at different scales. Uh, I'm not going into detail, that's, but if you want to read the, the paper we wrote, there's like five pages of equations describing this. Uh, if you do this, you end up with a continuity equation, 
but this is a, a divergence of a vector that is equal to some constant, but this divergence is in the scale space. So it's with respect to the scale, not with respect to position. This is a bit maybe odd concept, but just accept it. But it's, uh, um, it's basically saying how much of this vector, which is uh, energy flux, goes across a scale. And so describes the cascade property. If you do this with all this machinery, you end up with a very long equation with a lot of terms, which are very difficult to estimate, but under several assumptions, which are more or less reasonable, depending on the system you have, these are like the standard, like incompressibility, homogeneity of the system, sessionarity of the system, and, and the high, high Reynolds number, I didn't say it before, but the Reynolds number, I completely skipped that one. The Reynolds number is a number that says how important is the nonlinear term with respect to the dissipation term. So when Reynolds is high, then there is a lot of nonlinear transfer, a lot of turbulence, and uh, that scaling range in the middle of the spectrum is very broad. The larger the Reynolds, the broader the spectrum. So in order for this machinery to work, you need a large Reynolds number so you can get a large range, large, you can basically neglect the effects of dissipation and also the effects of the stirring spoon and focus on the central part where those are far away and they don't matter anymore. So if you do that, you can eliminate a lot of terms in this equation. Then if you uh, hypothesize also isotropy of the turbulence, you can get rid of other terms. Um, and in the end, you end up with an equation which is more or less simple. And it's actually very simple to estimate from data, to calculate from data from time series. This is an equation that this vector is now a scalar, but because it usually is projected on one direction. So it's a, it's a scalar, it's a component of, of that vector here, energy flux. This energy flux can be described as kinetic energy plus magnetic energy. And those deltas here represent a scale. So again, this is a fluctuation at a given scale. These are RMS at a given scale. This is the magnetic energy and the kinetic energy which are coupled to, to velocity gradients. And this is a bit odd, but again, this is where the idea of vortex that stretches something around and carries the energy across scale come in. So you have this term here. There is another term which is uh, peculiar and specific to plasmas. And there is when, yeah, however, when there is alpha and waves kind of fluctuations, fluctuations which have very strong velocity and magnetic field correlations, this tend to keep the wave property they have, and so don't mix much with the other case, uh, with the other scales. So they tend to reduce the cascade. So there is a minus sign, a reduction of energy in the cascade. Uh, and this is uh, this correlated VB fluctuations associated to the magnetic field, which is the, the age, the, the, the responsible for the alpha wave to, to, to start being the wave, right? So in some sense, the association of alpha waves and magnetic field is quite evident. And, and I think this terms explain it well, very well. So you have energy and we can call it cross helicity maybe term, an energy term that adds to the cascade, transfer energy from the large scale down to the smaller scales, smaller vortices. And the cross helicity that tends to stop that, just no, don't transfer too much. I like to be a wave. I prefer to be here uh, localized in, in, the sp in the scale space. Uh, in fluids, normal fluids, this is way more simple. This is just velocity. So if you eliminate the magnetic field there, you just end up with a, basically is a cube of, uh, of the velocity fluctuation that is proportional to something. So what is this? Oh, next slide. This is proportional to something. And this something turns out to be uh, the scale. So this is a scaling relation, which means this quantity has the same statistical properties as the scale with the power. In this case, the power is one. It's not just nothing. There is an, an exponent here and it turns out to be one. So this is a linear relation between those quantities, which is a, a moment. Notice that there is a, an average here, which means this is a statistical quantity. Statistically, this quantities, this vector of energy flux across scales is uh, proportional to the, to the scale. And it's proportional uh, by a, a coefficient, which turns out again to be the energy transfer rate that we saw before 
in the picture with the cascade uh, uh, and the energy going across the scale. So the energy transfer rate can be estimated from the data, even in the cases like in the solar wind, where you have no other way to estimate because there's no viscous dissipation. So you cannot calculate the dissipation rate, but you can assume that let's assume all the energy is dissipated, then the energy dissipation should be the same as the energy transfer. Okay, then if I can measure the energy transfer using the data, and I can, thanks to this law, then I know how much energy is dissipated by the turbulence. This is very important in the solar wind specifically, because again, I say that some of the heating of the wind as it expands might be due to dissipation of energy from, from the turbulence. And since we cannot estimate in other ways how much energy is dissipated in the solar wind, this equation is a way to give an estimate at least of that quantity and <coughs> make sure that actually the turbulence can be responsible for heating the solar wind. So there are results about that. Maybe I show some, but let's see. Um, five minutes or yeah, sure. What time is it? Well, more or less. Okay, so um, this this is a low. Then it's a it's a exact low, and it's been um, written down in ninety eight, I think, for plasmas. Uh, and then there was some observation in numerical simulations and also in data in the solar wind data. Uh, so that's the vector I was talking about, the, this third order moment, the, that quantity that you use for the relation. And this is the scale. And the linear relation is quite evident in several cases. So it's a, it exists in the solar wind. It pops up. It took nearly 10 years to get uh, identified because it's a very delicate quantity. The fluctuations of the fields are positive and negative, so they cancel each other. And if you want to build something that is not zero at the end, you need to put a lot of them in order to stabilize the or to have the, the convergence of the statistics so that a sign thing that doesn't cancel out to zero emerge. So you need a lot of statistics. It's not very easy, but it took a while, but it was uh, observed in the end. But then, of course, I said before that there is a lot of uh, uh, hypothesis that we need to make to, for that law to be so simple. But there are some versions in the years uh, that came out a, a number of versions that relax some of those hypotheses. And finally, probably there is one which relaxes most of them, nearly all of them. And these are what we call the alternative versions of this law, uh, which is called, by the way, politano bouquet law. Um, and they are a bit complicated. And each one, so in, historically, they try to get rid of one of the uh, approximations each time. For example, because the solar wind is not really isotropic, is not really stationary, is not really homogeneous, and sometimes it's not even really incompressible, those things were dropped down little by little, improving the, the relationship. And there are various uh, versions. I'm going to go very quickly through them. Uh, for example, one can uh, uh, remove the hypothesis of isotropy and introduce some sort of model of the turbulence uh, fluctuations and imagining that it's a 2D plus 1D. So it's a isotropic in a plane perpendicular to the magnetic field. And then in a, it's a different turbulence along the magnetic field, which is reasonable and observed also in sort of wind. If you do that, you can separate into those low and then retrieve the original energy, which was observed. Uh, also, because of the presence of possible shears in the solar wind, for example, this parts where fast and slow solar wind go next to each other, there is a shear between the two. This can be included also, there will be some additional term in the equations, um, they call source terms because they provide energy to the cascade, in some sense it's a source of energy. Uh, and these terms can be evaluated with some specific modeling. Also other terms, different terms come in if you consider the shear that naturally occur because of the expansion of the wind in which the radial and the two transverse components will expand differently with the, with the distance. And this introduces more shears that give more terms that can be evaluated not very successfully so far, as far as I'm, I know. Um, there's other things that can be done. One can see a little bit farther down the scales if one includes Hall effects. So from MHD, one can skip to Hall MHD. And in that case, find a, a a low with some additional terms, again, that be considered, and then extend the linear term 
from the whole first from the MHD, which is the green line in this case, plus the whole term that enters at some point. And the sum of the two will give a broader extent of transfer of energy, which means we can pick a little bit down into sub ion scales using this, but it's not sufficient. But still, it's a good approximation. And then the big step that required a lot of mathematics was introducing compressibility that messes up a lot because it introduces one extra variable in the system. It's not an extra term, it's an extra variable, which makes us everything complicated. And in the end, in fact, actually, this is the original equation that comes out after the uh, all the machinery that I showed before. So I'm not even trying to, to, to check this, just look at the length of the thing. Then you can condensate these parts into these fancy names up here. But most of these quantities cannot estimated, cannot be estimated in the solar wind from one point satellite measurements, uh, which are 1D. They, they will require 3D measurements. Uh, so in the simulations, they can be estimated, not in the uh, not in the data, but still you can remove everything that you can assume that everything you cannot estimate would be negligible. That's you know, a typical thing to do. And then you get a simplified version that can be not observed. And can, in, in those cases, for example, in the magnetic sheath, in the terrestrial magnetic sheath, where the plasma is a little bit more compressible, this thing show uh, an effect, an increase of energy due to the compressions. It's also very useful for interstellar turbulence. So there were several studies uh, using numerical simulations, of course, in this case, uh, where uh, they use this version to describe the transfer of energy across scales and the intermittency and the emergency of, uh, of structures. Okay, I think I might skip completely the, the examples um, that I had, but I think it's... I, I will stop here. Thanks. I was going to say, uh, I expand a lot today. <laughs> Thank you very much for, for, actually, for your fantastic talk. Um, are there any questions? Uh, uh, let me start with a comment that uh, uh, many things which are neglected in the solar wind uh, because of one point measurements uh, can be measured in the monitor sheets. And we are working on it together. Yeah, thanks to MMS, uh, which has a like multi-dimensional yeah. time series. So you can you can get some of the gradients. So the, the main problem is that when you do time series, you can only estimate cuts in one direction. So gradients only in one direction, while you need the full divergency of a vector, which means you need derivatives over different directions. So this is possible when you use MMS uh, or similar uh, things. You, you have, yeah, you have, several directions across which you can estimate gradients and that allows some of these terms to be estimated. Yeah. Yeah. Some. Okay. Was probably... okay, we have a question there from Michaela. Thank you for the talk, especially going into the questions and really explaining what those things are. I really appreciate that. Um, also relating to the very nice approach, I mean, the fact is that, okay, you want to estimate these uh, values in CD and you don't have measurements, so in the solar wind, yeah. In in the in spacecraft measurements, yeah. yeah. Correct. So it's not the simulation. This is one of the ways. Of course, depending on what, how your simulation works, right? You always turn out something, right? Or you're probably missing something. So how do you know if it works or not? I mean, is there some way in order you can uh, realize that maybe this I mean the simulation might be incomplete? Absolutely. So I, I guess this is the way simulations are used. So you get a simulation that um, represents a specific point in a specific uh, configuration that you want to study, and you check if things like that turned out to be correct. Then you make run another simulation with different parameters and explore a little bit more. But there is no one-to-one -one thing. You you will need you know a super simulation of a solar wind size, uh, heliosphere size system that resolves down to the ion scales, and this is of course our question. So yes, there is. So the use of simulation needs to be done carefully, but there are several cases in which you can find element, piece, intervals in the solar wind that can be mapped to some simulation reasonably. Uh, or you can start adding things into the simulation, like you can add some shears, some flux ropes passing by, uh, some expansion things, and those things are done. 
unfortunately, typically one by one. So one at each time. And it is true, there is no, uh, let's say, completely self-consistent global simulation um, that can be used for that. But, you know, you do what yeah. you can and then... Okay. Mm -hmm. I, I just want to switch from how you make this work. But again, today you need to have some matching between operation and the operation yeah. and yep. the process. It's a, it's a step by step process, yeah. yeah. Okay. We have a question from an uh, online uh, listener. So he says, so that's Owen Roberts. He says, hi, Luca, thanks for the talk. One thing I have been wondering about is that there is often that there is not often a well developed inertial range in the magnetic sheaths. Yeah. However, many people have calculated energy cascade grades using Politano Fuki. Yeah, I not. have not commented on whether one should use this in the magnetic uh, sheath. It's totally correct. Um, so the magnetic sheath is a system which is a bit peculiar from the point of view of turbulence. I mean, here we have one of the major uh, experts of that in that the solar wind is going through the shock at the bow shock and this is completely shuffled and in some sense there is a cabbage plus knife picture you showed before uh, so all the fluctuations at the given scales are cut away they are just smeared out they lose correlation and so whatever passes into the magnetic sheet only has a little bit of those original properties of the of the fluctuations in the turbulence in some sense you could say that through the shock the correlations that are built by the turbulence, which are those structures, those vortices, are destroyed. And then they start reforming after the bow shock. And then when you go away from the bow shock, they, they let's say, they reform the turbulence. The turbulence starts once again. But near the bow shock, typically, there's nearly no real turbulence. Definitely, there is no inertial range. And when you go away, the inertial range starts to expand. So if you select properly the, the intervals in the magnetic sheet, you can find intervals with sufficient inertial range as to have this kind of analysis. It is true that some people have done the same on data with barely no inertial range. I have personally the feeling that finding this low value data, even with really, really short or even absent inertial range, in my opinion, it is an indication that nonlinear interactions are present, are starting to build the cascade, but it's still too early to see it in the spectrum. So it's an early stage, so it might be not as beautifully linear, uh, but it might be there. So there, there is some energy flux, which immediately starts as, as soon as the wind crosses the, the bow shot. I just would like to add that the absence of the inertia range behind the shock doesn't mean that there is no turbulence, but the nature of turbulence where the kinetic range is, is different from the solar wind, that the, the inertia range is over several yeah. decades. Yeah, I'm sorry. It's, yeah. Let's say it's not completely destroyed, but it's yeah. uh, reduced in my effect. Yeah, so all the measurements you have so far is one point, right? And then the NMS could give four, but how, what would it take to actually follow a vortex's cascade? Uh, because it moves as it goes, right? You you have a point and yeah. you measure it, and then you, you it, it goes away and you cannot follow it. You yeah. can measure another cascade of another vortex and then you run statistics to make a parallel. Precisely. But what you would like to do is kind of be able to follow at many multi points. No, that's in the dreams. So that's no, that's never going to be the case. Mm -hmm. So it's not that. So I forgot so to show. Scale. When you want to follow it, you want to follow it on many scales. You, you it's always going to be statistics. It's always going to be statistical. There's no way to, to follow dynamically. A structure you can do it in some lab, maybe in the simulations. You can do it, hmm? no, I uh, no, not really. Then it's gone. I mean, you only measure once the same plasma, it's like the well, you, you need to have things that uh, four, yeah, yeah, that's our one planet, planet oh, like one orbiter at uh, Vigil, yeah. and then one orbiter at Earth, or something like whatever. One year planet, are... okay, I, but, I see your point, yeah. but the point is more because you are saying that the Cascade uh, goes only in, in, it's not like uniform, it's like localized. And to prove this, you would need a measurement to be able to track several scales. Uh, no? Am I no, this is okay. In principle, you would like to do that, but yeah. this is impossible. So the way you do that is there are two ways to do it. First, you use numerical simulations where you actually can follow in time and yeah. see the flow of the energy and, and all of this. 
Second, in the data, you trust, you don't look for the actual evolution of one single thing, but you look for the statistical distribution of all those size uh, structures. And those about those, you can say something. So you, you know that they're going to be distributed irregularly and homogeneously and things like that. So there are models that you can use to reproduce the statistical distribution of those things that come from that idea, even though you don't measure it literally. Because it really, there's no way to measure it, not even with the um, hideous worm. Hideous worm is a, is a mission that has uh, 14 satellites or something like that, several satellites in a multi tetraid configuration so that can measure at the same time different scales in different directions and in a lot of directions and can give a lot of better estimates of these quantities. And it's actually one of the reasons why it's being is going to be launched, which makes this very important, right? We're going to get a, a space mission for that. So okay, yeah. so I think last question. She was her screen goes to Christiane. I have three questions. Oh no. <laughs> Pick one. No, two. Uh, can, can you go uh, to your when, when you introduce this, this Y um, um, vector, I guess, capital Y thing? Uh, yes, this one. It doesn't matter. Yes. So, am I right that no, the, 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 this one? This, these are uh, local averages, right? So no, these are global averages. This 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 averaging. This is a global average. This is over yeah a volume or a time series or an inter a large interval. So this is a where the turbulence becomes statistics. So you need statistics over a yeah, yeah, over okay, a. Okay, I understand it, but it's it's locally right. It's not over time. It's a, it's. A oh yeah, sorry. Time. But it means you get whites for various scales. Yes. From from the smallest to the largest. Yes. Okay. I I yeah. skipped one important point, which is that um. All I said about the size of the structures mm -hmm. means that the fluctuations we're talking about and the divergence is in space. in space. But from time series, you get, of course, time series, but you use Taylor hypothesis, which uh, to switch from time scales in the time series to K or, or to scales, space scales in the theoretical. Yeah, so. and here we are now coming to this, to this um, scaling in layouts. So I have been staring at this for, for a long time. And this is basically assuming that you have a rather ho chemically homogeneous gas, right? So nothing really changes yep. in the in the gas. And only then you can talk about uh, scaling in the gas. Absolutely. So okay. there's no chemistry here. Absolutely. Actually, you need also to neglect the dissipation. So there's not yes. even that part yes. of the transformation. So it's only in the region where yes. everything is only about the energy transfer. So yes. And, and scaling is then is not applicable to systems which have an active chemistry. It's going to... It might be. You just need to look at the questions and redo the math. It might still apply depending on the form of those terms. For example, I know that there are ter there are equations. I was talking about that uh, for the a dynamo effect in the in the proto universe, whatever, mm -hmm. where they use MHD plus some chiriality where. You need to match that balance, and the reality will start some motions that will drive the dynamo for building the magnetic field. And those equations still preserve that scaling invariance. Yeah. But yeah. so it depends on the on term. Yeah, because now these equations and all the all the later ones, where does the um, characteristics of the matter come in? Okay, now you have an incompressible situation, but this is still chemically homogeneous, right? Yeah, absolutely. I'm, yes. I'm basically asking because at some point, if your chemistry changes, you also have to change your heating and cooling. In your system, there would be source terms. So, in these equations, probably you won't be able to keep scaling. But then, if you go to the master equation, which is the, the big one, there you will have terms which have source of energy, like for the compressions or exactly. So, those kind of terms will be there if you have the data to compute it, like in a simulation or in a fancy super fantasy science fiction spacecraft. Yeah, so it can be, and then you need to go into stellar if you want to do that. Okay, so at this point, I would like to thank the speaker one more time. Thank you. So, uh, Luca is around today, and what I heard also tomorrow, tomorrow morning, morning. Yeah. Yes, yeah. yes, I'll be around. Uh, you have a common meeting, I think, the plasma meeting. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, yes. Uh -huh. here, coffee starts. <laughs>
From 10 to 11. Yeah, so, to 11. but he is also around this afternoon. So yeah, can please come along. Can you you had questions yeah. and just Beautiful. I can uh, be here and maybe you can. And we also have a common dinner. So, so I've organized our dinner at uh, seven o'clock in the uh, just. Uh, approximately seven people. So there is still space for three yeah. more people. Feel free to pass by. I reserve the table for 10 people. Okay. Thank you so much. Are you the